Hi, and welcome to Pilot's Notes, a series of videos in which we have a look at the aircraft we're used to flying at War Thunder, but through the eyes of the pilots who flew the real things. This series was originally going to be called A Pilot's Tale, but I thought this was a better title, so uh, there we are. In this episode, Commander Robert Mike Crosley, who, over the course of his rather interesting flying career, logged 2,818 hours in 147 different types of aircraft, takes us through the experience of starting the Swordfish when he was on duty boy detail at Yeovilton in Somerset as a Sprog pilot in 1941. The following words are his. The duty boy had to collect the Fulmers and Hurricanes parked out on the airfield. They were dispersed as a precaution against losing too many at once if a JU-88 or ME-110 came over on a strafing run. There happened to be a stray swordfish in a far-off corner of the airfield. This was naturally a challenge to any Hurricane pilot, bored with being duty boy and not having much fun. It therefore had to be rounded up whether it wanted to be or not. There was a routine for starting swordfish which called for advanced standards of airmanship, split-second timing and a nearby fire engine. If none of these conditions applied, there was usually trouble, especially if the fighter pilots, used to easy electrical starting, had a go. The routine was written down somewhere in pilot's notes for the swordfish, and after the removal of the covers, I climbed into the cockpit and, failing to find the notes, I made one or two inquiries of the riggers and fitters who accompanied me. Apparently the routine worked something like this. Magneto switches, off. Turn prop by hand to check no hydraulic locks. Prime engine cylinders with fuel. Check brakes on and pressure OK. Chocks in position. Select the strongest volunteer to insert the starting handle and commence turning. If no one volunteers, detail someone. The volunteer inserts the handle into any suitable looking hole he can find in the engine cowling and winds it round, getting faster and faster. There should be a grinding, whining sound. If there isn't, select another hole for the starter handle and try again. When there is no further chance of the winder increasing the revs from what must obviously be a sort of flywheel buzzing around inside, he should signal the pilot in the cockpit to engage. This links the grinding sound with the crankshaft of the engine in some way, and the grinding then gets slower as the engine gets faster. Both then come to a halt and the whole thing has to start again. If in the unlikely event the engine fires, the propeller starts to go round. The man with the handle should then remove it from its hole and run away quickly before he gets covered in oil, flames or smoke, or gets hit by the propeller or loses his hat down the air intake. I didn't see the rigger's frantic signals that he had reached the end of his energy in turning the flywheel. However, I had enough sense to realise that the revs were not getting any higher, so I pulled the tit to engage. The thing gave a slight chuffing noise for half a revolution and then there was silence once more. Silence, that is to say, except for the panting sounds and expletives coming from the rigger. Reinforcements then arrived and two men then started turning, one either side, another handle had been found in the observer's cockpit behind me. This took the engine by surprise as the revs were much higher than before and it began to fire on two of its nine cylinders. If it had been a Merlin, I'd have kept the starter button pressed and the priming pump going during this will-she-won't-she period and the other cylinders would have had to have joined in out of sheer embarrassment. But with the swordfish, only the waning revs from the flywheel arrangement could continue to give power. With but two cylinders out of nine, it's not enough on a cold morning for the engine to wake itself up unless something urgent is done. I was now told what this was by a crowd of interested onlookers. More dope, pilot, and no, you've given it too much already. There are flames coming out of the intake, sir, and... Try again with more throttle, and put your hat over the air intake and put the flames out, you idiot. And no, you'll have to blow out now, she's too rich. Eventually, with me priming as hard as I could, the other cylinders gradually joined in with the two that hadn't let me down, and the whole aircraft disappeared from sight in a cloud of blue smoke, visible from Queen Camel four miles away. The birds flew up in alarm, the fire crews fingered their nozzles, others ran after their hats, but all was well. Having recovered a little of my confidence, I waved the chocks away and trundled the swordfish towards the duty flight hangar. Commander Crossley had a pretty eventful war, followed by a pretty eventful piece as a hugely talented test pilot. You can read all about it in his autobiography entitled They Gave Me a Sea Fire. It's a highly engaging read, which I thoroughly recommend and will probably be returning to quite a bit. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link in the description box below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and as usual, thanks for watching. If you'd like to be alerted to future episodes, then please feel free to subscribe, and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.